notes on the stance this weekend. We are missing one extremely notable result. And Alexander S., who was on the podcast a little bit, he was the only or, you know, one of the only two players to play Far Soccer Kinban this weekend. And he was able to punch a golden ticket at the Lone Star Open 2024, which is another independent, independently run FLG event, if I remember correctly. He went 5-0 and and got a clean record with Far Soccer. The only player, I believe to actually yeah, play them this weekend because is our stats keep track of, on, this ch- on this chart we need at least three players to be counted as a notable result so it's either him and one other person or just him this weekend went five zero, still possible that's wild that's incredible yeah. consistent performance with those far stalkers yeah 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 he's quite good with them so we'll see if he can do the same thing at the Worlds, or, you know, if it is a notable result in Texas, but doesn't really land on the world stage. I do think that there's, they have some okay matchups right now. Like, they do seem pretty well poised to fight against Mandrakes and Brood Brothers in the sense that they have enough operatives to trade. And against Brood Brothers, that is basically the Far Stalker's best matchup. A bunch of dudes that you can run at and kill. So, if the, if you can distract the Patriarch long enough, or you can just funnel enough guns in to chip him down, maybe it's enough. I'm rooting for him. Uh, c- can you see what his like top matchups were? Yeah, I can bring it up. Uh, as far as actual player counts this week, this is the return of Age of Sigmar. So Age of Sigmar is back up to full strength. They had 700 players to our 350, so we're about half the size of Age of Sigmar. We'll see if that continues to grow. I suspect it might. It makes sense with that fourth edition. Yeah, and like it's a slow turning beast, those bigger games. Oh yeah. And then forty K is all the way up to three thousand players. So we've got a ways to go if we're ever gonna catch up with the mighty beast. That said, it was a pretty cool weekend. As far as stats go, there's some notable things you know a lot of the big meta menaces did not climb up to some insane play rate or they have high play rates but their win rates are not, maybe not as crazy as some of the past ones you know 55 percent on brew brothers does represent that they are quite good but mandrakes only about 50 percent so definitely or exactly 50 percent almost with uh, the true win percentage when taking out mandrake mirror matches yeah as far as our far soccer friend he played against Phobos, a good matchup, I think, for Crute. Uh Chaos Cult, an impressive one, because it does represent being able to chip down some of the big guys. Round three, Higher Tech Circle, also a pretty solid win, although Higher Tech Circle are far diminished from their previous impossible match layer. They beat Brood Ooh. Brothers by three points against Ryan Z, who was Texas's last year's representative at the World Championships. He was a nice dude. And then round five, he played against Dylan Went on Wormblade and crushed him 23 to 8. Dang. So me thinks there do be life. <clears throat> yeah, that's and wild. Turns out, if I remember correctly, actually, so Alex actually got a ticket maybe a couple weeks ago. So Dylan actually got the ticket. So the Wormblade player who got defeated by Crute got the ticket. But. It is it is interesting because crew five and zero only player, maybe there's still something there. But you do you cannot play the basic game that everyone else is playing. You do have to play the game that the far stalkers want to play. Yeah, yeah. And for as anyone that as... is watching this and wants to get a little insight, we do have an episode on that. So um, roll back and and find the episode called "Crew Won a Golden Ticket." Yeah. As far as the meta within Tacoma, we have some breakdowns of the stats for Tacoma specifically. Scout Squad, Novitiates, Wormblade all had over 60% win rates. Felgor, Exaction Squad, Brood Brothers, Star Striders were above 50. And then Mandrakes, Hernkin, Nemesis Claw, Commandos were in the 50 to 45 band. <clears throat> So pretty solid turnout for the tournament. Mandrix obviously took the win. You know, if anyone's keeping track of the results, Adrian was able to find the line in multiple games and climb out of some pretty impressive deficits on the second day. I think he came back from a 1-4-1-4 against Wormblade. And also like a 1-4-1-4 against 
Brood Brothers. So he beat Chris and Jimmy, or he tied Chris after losing a lot of points for the first two turns, and then he was able to beat Jimmy by climbing back on turns three and turns four. Okay, I think that's a little insight into the uh, patient play style of the successful Mandrake player. Yeah, you gotta be. You you're not really there to push your stats forward. You're really there to chip away until the creeping dread lets you fully take control. Yeah, just haunt them for a little bit, and then. Uh huh. Yep. We had Void Dancers do pretty well this weekend. You know, four players took them. Almost all of them had winning records. We have a 3-0 in Italy at a small eight-person tournament, but he was the undefeated winner. And then James, one of our local Brooklyn, one of my local Brooklyn players, went to the same Lone Star Open to try to grab a ticket. Played Void Dancers, and he went uh, 3-0 or 3-1-1. There's a 1-1 record with Basement Bastards, and then at Tacoma Open, the a single, maybe not the single Void Dancers player, but the Void Dancer player who won, I think, best in his bracket, was 4-2-1. So a pretty solid result. Yeah. As far as the raw there. numbers go this weekend, Wormblade had a 62% win rate, and their average first loss was round three which does kind of point in the direction of them being one of the stronger teams right now. And they've been doing that very consistently. Like, Wormblade has been hanging in there. It seems to me that Wormblade players are quite good on loot and secure where they can get out to an early advantage and maintain the early advantage and just basically make it to the end game with no operatives left, but having secured such a large advantage from the early board presence on turns one and two that it doesn't really matter because you can go meticulous plan, dash onto some stuff, grab stuff on the mid board on those diagonal layouts, and you have enough guns where your opponent's got to keep his head down. So they do seem to have been doing pretty good. Imperial Navy Breachers, you know, after having a huge losing streak for the last, I want to say like month, had a pretty good showing this weekend. They had a casual 3-0 um, a 2 1 at that same casual tournament, and then a couple of lesser results, but a nice little 60% win rate for a team that's really been lagging behind everyone else. Um, it's amusing to see that Scout Squad has been doing, well, I mean, at least this weekend, they've kind of been jumping around a little bit, but it seems like generally they've been doing pretty good, including this weekend. Um, do we have any, like, uh, what were some of the like best of the the scout squad? Uh, best of the scouts. No one was able to take an undefeated record, so everyone took a loss at some point. So it doesn't seem like like scouts do have their bad matchup, their finesse matchups uh, at Tacoma this weekend. Jimmy Jimmy K, who took Wormblade, basically said that he was able to smash scouts consistently with Wormblade. So that may be part of why. Wormblade are doing a little bit better. They've got a couple more things they can hunt in the meta. And overall, it seems like they are very good. They do stat check people really hard. So at like the mid-tier tables, just the wall of meatheads with 4-4 four, four guns does ruin a lot of people's days. But then at Tacoma, I watched basically both of the scout squads that made it into the championship bracket just not able to out-finesse their opponents. Or in the case of James versus Matt W., Basically, James just gave up on the game because he didn't enjoy playing at the the high level of sweat and discussion. Blooded also had another resurgent weekend. They had Brandon B., one of the Pacific Northwest players who really enjoys Blooded, take them on a 7-0 or 7-1 or 6-1 record. <clears throat> Basically clearing out his opponents with in the, his bracket with a clean undefeated record in the 3-1 bracket. Basically showing off that Blooded still can do it even with a nerf. Like it's not it's not the nerf that Blooded like Blooded can still hang with the, the best of them, basically. Alright. With some other stats. Death Guard had an interesting weekend, actually. <laughs> they were able to get a fifty eight point three percent win rate, which is kind of hilarious. That is kind of hilarious. And um did anyone like win like a small event with that? 
uh, you know, it's interesting. Death Guard don't sh- like Death Guard show up as the faction, but then I cannot see their actual stats. So I kind of assume they might be getting muddied up with Compendium. I do know the one player that I saw at Tacoma with Death Guard did not do particularly well with them, so I don't really know if that is useful data there. So just like an interesting quirk of the low play rates, which is generally something we see with the very low play rates. So as numbers of players go down, better players or smaller scenes tend to overrepresent in those data sets. Just like these yeah. Imperial Navy Breachers players who did well. Like generically, I don't think the team has been doing all that well, but every once in a while at small things or like intercession, kind of stuff like that. Yeah. As far as the large data that's sets. Like a- Ultimately, I think that's like a great sign of balance because if someone can just like pull something out and and like it's not popular and and do a big swing for it, like that's a sign of a healthy game. Yeah. As far as, you know, the meta menaces looking at Brood Brothers and Mandrakes, their overall play rates were not that incredible this weekend. You know, 55 and 50 percent are good, but not utterly broken. I think as far as going to. The big wins, you know, there were 17 players on Brood Brothers this weekend, and of those 17, four of them had undefeated records, or five of them. There's two other small ones, too, which were, like, mini two-round tournaments, so I'm not really going to count those. But as far as, like, the three-round and up, we had five undefeated records. One of them was a 201, so one of them was a draw, and Chris got second by the raw numbers at Tacoma, even though he did not get, like, best overall, but by raw numbers, he was... Five and two, or five oh two, so two ties and five, five wins, and I think even think in that first round of the game, or the first round of the tournament, if I remember, he was saying that it's a really hard matchup for him. So all the way back in round one, I think it was a scout matchup. Nope, it was Phobos. So Zach, one of the players from the Pacific Northwest area, was able to get Chris down to a draw with Phobos. So as good as Brood Brothers are, they still do represent some issues as far as piloting up. That said, Chris's tie probably did allow him to get a slightly easier run up the rest of the first day, beating Hernkin, Nemesis Claw, and Novitiates. <clears throat> so while they are good, they still have some weaknesses. Mandrakes also had a pretty solid weekend with Adrian going the full 601 at Tacoma. But overall, they had 27 players, so quite a few games, but only two really notice- noticeable crushes. And even then, it was a 3 0 and then a couple 2 2 0s, with Adrian being like the lone one sitting at the top. So it does feel like lots of players are able to adapt to fighting against the Mandrakes. So as good as they are, you know, they are high skill cap team, you know, nine models, eight wounds definitely is pretty rough if you are not using your stats perfectly. Yeah, especially without that easy access to the third APL really kind of makes it extra tough. Yeah, if you cannot set up your chooser to in a position where it's going to get you your third APL, it's going to be a very rough game. I think one stat, one trick that Adrian was able to pull off to climb out of a big hole of a three operatives and probably like I think six or seven points down was getting the smoke, sniping it down to the other side of the board so that he could safely teleport a chooser, and then the chooser was able to charge out the following turn, kill a dude. And then kill another dude, and then he had all four of his last couple operatives running around with three APL. Which, when you can teleport to an objective your opponent can't touch, grab it, and then run away, would be very frustrating. So really, yeah, really okay. angling for the, the catch back up on turn three and turn four, after sniping people out with a couple asymmetric things. As far yeah, as some crazy. other interesting cool. results... You know, we've got Nemesis Claw, Hernkin Jaeger, Warp Coven, Star Striders, Hearthkin Salvagers, all just around the 45% mark, which is pretty nice. Hernkin Jaeger, you know, a stable team that have not really done that badly since release. They haven't been winning any big tournaments, but they haven't really been losing any big tournaments either as far as, like, getting crushed. It does seem like Hearthkin Salvagers are also one of those teams that have been pretty good. The new buff definitely has helped. They have one undefeated record this weekend, a 201 out in Cantabria, which is España, so somewhere in Spain. In a tournament where tournament winner of the World Championships, Hava, was playing on Brood Brothers. So 
Warp Coven, also in that tournament, went 3-0 and actually beat Hava. So it does seem like there's a little bit of life in the unplayed meta. So Warp Coven, Hearth Consolvers, Hernkin Jaeger, all definitely still in contention for teams that probably could still make it with a good enough pilot. Yeah, sneak out and get you. Um, crazy to see Pathfinders at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, eight players, basically no one doing well with them, kind of showing off how they can be just hard to run and hard to pilot. Like, if you're not doing everything, they are just a bunch of dorks that hit on fours with one reroll, which is not enough. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if anyone playing Intercession did anything uh, extra cool looking. Uh, we had one three zero down in Mexico. So, but that tournament was uh, intercession on the top two slots. Based probably, I would assume, just like newer players playing the game and intercession just doing intercession things. There's no roster, so I won't know. I won't know if they're doing anything yeah. too crazy. Yeah, Strike Force Justine also did pop up this weekend as a team with, with a win rate. They had uh, three players, so just enough to collect stats, and they got a 44% win rate, which is not great by any stretch of the imagination. But it does seem like in Florida, they were able to... Oh, actually, in Florida, they were first place in a six-man tournament with one loss because they had the best score otherwise. Cute. Yeah, lots of silly stats this weekend, especially in the smaller data sets. Phobos actually had one of the more robust data sets this weekend with 26 games played and a 44% win rate. However, with that said, four of those 26 players were able to get undefeated records. Three three zeros and one three oh one. And that three oh one was also in Spain, where they got second place, only lose only uh tying to generic green skins. Ooh, yeah. Generic green skins are... They're something. And uh, looking at the Spanish rosters, there are no rosters. So it could be a situation where the green skins are getting an uncapped roster and able to switch back and forth between all of their skews. So it could be another situation of Spain playing ahead of the meta if they think that next edition won't have rosters. So that's a that's a pretty interesting one. And actually, at that same tournament, fourth place was Carlos Duran, currently worldwide number one ITC. So he was on Inquisition Agents and lost a game. So let's see if we can figure out the pairings, because I'm kind of curious if we can spot it. So Carlos yeah, It was lost, just the one game that he lost? And he lost one round hard. to Phobos. Ooh. So the second place Phobos, who went 301 this weekend, did manage to beat Inquisition Agents. And the Inquisition agents were being piloted by the current worldwide number one. So even if that Phobos seems like a very aren't doing that well, result. yeah, even if we're looking at just generic win rate, it does seem like Phobos, just like some of these other teams, still has gas in the tank if a player really does want to try to make it work. But very little wiggle room on a 12 wound team with six models. Oh, and his tie, yeah, had to have been against that. So green skins. So yeah, pretty cool weekend as far as like the stats go. Geller Pox, again, you know, not doing all that great. The generic play generally doesn't do all that well with them. It's really like three or four players that on Geller Pox basically are doing everything correct, not getting shot on turn one, not getting shot until later, and then just stat checking the shit out of your opponent on turns three and four. So if anyone's looking for a hard team, that has infinite room at the top. Galar Pox definitely are the ones because they have not been nerfed because only a handful of players can be good with them. Yeah. Uh, Casterkin had a 3-0 record, only five players, and Hunter Clade had seven players in one 3-0 record. So a couple of these teams still able to do well at these small tournaments, still running into some issues at the larger tournaments, or just not getting more rounds. Yeah. Any other questions that you want to check in on the weekly stat show before we call it a day, Jason? I think that kind of that kind of hits it for me. All right, all right. Well, for anyone listening to on YouTube, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And for our Patreon list watchers who see this on Mondays, you know, thank you again for 
catching up with us and checking in on the tournament scene. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs>